All right. It's about five past. Just the final call if um, Brian Cantrell, John Bull, Sam Lambert, or Quinton are here. All right. Um, Alexis, feel free to steer, but fairly crisp agenda today with a presentation. You there, Alexis? Did we lose you? Are you mute? Is it only me or I can't hear Alexis? Uh, I can't hear him either. Okay. Why don't you go ahead, Chris? Yeah, he'll come back on. All right, so if we go to uh, slide five and six, uh, kind of agenda is fairly brief today. We have a presentation, community presentation from the Falco uh, project. Um, we have some discussions around the community backlog of upcoming project proposals. Uh, and requested due diligence from the community. And then we kind of have an open Q&A session. So slide six, uh, really an important call from community kind of review the upcoming uh, project proposals that we have. Um, as a reminder, uh, Open Metrics and Harbor are both going to be entering the uh, sandbox soon. Um, <clears throat> Cortex uh, is looking for an additional uh, TOC sponsor. So uh, if you're interested, in sponsoring that project, please uh, reach out to them or want to provide them any due diligence, go for it uh, on that issue. In terms of the backlog, we have a variety of uh, projects that will be presented to the TOC uh, soon. So feel free to look uh, and, and go through any of those links if those projects interest you. Uh, slide seven. Oh, go ahead. Someone's going to say something. Hey, I was just saying that I'm back now. Sorry, I had to go and get my cable for my machine. I apologize. Thanks for taking over, Chris. Yeah, no worries. I pretty much have dropped you off on the due diligence slide. So if there's any particular calls to action you want to make, go for it. I just want to mention Cordex. You know, we've got um, Ken is stepping up to sponsor. I think the delay there is that uh, Brian Cantrell is talking to the Cortex community. Um, he wants to do some, you know, personal DD on, 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 on what they think and do. That's talking to Fresh Tracks. Um, Grafana, Weaveworks, and uh, Electronic Arts in particular. And hopefully that will lead to a good conclusion. But if anyone else wants to have a look, please, please get in touch with me or directly with Bob Cotton from Fresh Tracks, please. I'll put you in touch. Okay, so Falco time, I believe. Do we have Loris and Ducey on the call? Yep, we're both on. Yes. Okay, this is the floor is yours. Um, you've got about 15 minutes, please, but and assume some, some questions afterwards. Okay, sounds good. Uh, and uh, we can do a demo if you want as well, if we have enough time. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump to slide number eight. Uh, so what is Falco? So uh, Falco is an open source project. Uh, it's been around since about 2016. Um, it's basically what it's for is abnormal behavior detection for Linux-based containers, hosts, and orchestration platforms. Uh, the industry has kind of settled on a term called runtime security, um, and we're seeing more and more uh, co competitors and other projects using this term runtime security. So it has a filter language, and this filter language can easily detect events such as shells being spawned inside of a container, unexpected outbound connections, uh, processes listening on ports that you shouldn't uh, be listening on or it shouldn't be listening on, or a particular container image listening on ports that it shouldn't be listening on. Uh, files or binaries changing after container start, uh, and so forth. And uh, where we see the real value is in detecting these events, but then having these automated actions that can be taken when abnormal events are detected. So slide nine kind of frames up why you need it. Uh, so the cloud native paradigm really gives you a lot of choice around packaging decisions being pushed to development teams. Uh, kind of what the industry has settled on is uh, using image scanning to basically uh, make sure that whatever artifacts are being pulled into a container image, that we know the provenance of those artifacts, but then also are those artifacts uh, ha containing some known security vulnerability or something like that. And the challenge with that, while that's useful, um, the challenge with it is that it's point in time security. So when the scan is done during the container build process, 
we blessed it, we know that it's a known good container. Uh, but once that container starts running, uh, the runtime environment often isn't immutable. So uh, developers can have scripts that run that make changes, uh, or for instance, you know, kind of um, even something that wouldn't be malicious. All of a sudden, a developer has a new API endpoint from a third party that it's calling out to that we didn't necessarily know that it would be making that outbound connection to. It can connect, connect uh, it can catch, you know, stuff like that as well. Um, there's also resource isolation paradigms uh, as well. Uh, and we need to be able to detect those breaks down in isolation. Uh, Falco is kind of part of a, a multi-layered approach to security that we're finding that to become more and more common uh, in the container orchestrator cloud native world. Uh, and we think that having multiple layers to detect these types of abnormal behaviors are really important. Uh, as I said before, we can connect, uh, we can detect a variety of different things from container isolation being broken uh, so a vulnerability in a container runtime or a Linux kernel allowing you to break isolation, uh, applications being exploited uh, and running things like Bitcoin miners or getting access into the broader environment uh, as well. And then orchestration systems being uh, uh, exploited through things like exposed dashboards, exposed API ports, and so forth. And what Falco will allow you to do is, is help you enforce these best practices, but also will help you enforce compliance requirements around things like CIS, PCI, SOX, our favorite now, GDPR, and also your organizational security best practices. So on slide 10, uh, a little bit of how Falco works. Uh, so there's a kernel module. Uh, we're gonna be releasing eBPF support uh, very shortly. That's an alpha right now, but we hope to have it vetted uh, by the end of August and have it released out. Uh, and what this basically does is it taps into the system calls uh, from the kernel. And that stream of system calls basically goes up into processing libraries and that's where the filter engine or the expression engine picks up uh, those events and will then route any suspicious, suspicious events over to the alerting engine. And that alerting engine right now is pretty basic, but it can alert to a variety of different destinations such as syslog, uh, a normal file, standard out, or calling uh, programs via a shell. One of the integrations that we did that I'll talk about here in a second is where we were actually uh, integrating in with NATS and having the alerts sent over to a NATS messaging server, and then uh, actors can subscribe to those messages and take, take actions uh, based upon those events. Uh, a little bit of uh, information about the project, some metrics around the project on slide 11. Uh, just wait for people to jump to slide 11. Uh, as I said, it was started in the spring of 2016. Uh, we've had about 3,400 down, or sorry, 34,000 downloads of the RPMs themselves uh, and over 900,000 Docker Hub polls. Uh, we're at about 831 GitHub stars, at least when I uh, uh, took this snapshot of these numbers. Uh, we have about three maintainers. They're all from Sysdig right now, uh, and we have about 16 uh, contributors as well. We have a fairly active Slack channel. And from a user base perspective, uh, cloud.gov uh, is probably uh, our, our number one user right now that at least has talked about what they're doing with Falco, and there's a few links there in the presentation. Um, <clears throat> The interesting thing about cloud.gov is they're using Cloud Foundry. Uh, and what they did is they basically have the ability to detect an application that's tainted uh, uh, in Cloud Foundry. <clears throat> and then they wrote a little Go program called Gardener that goes and talks to Garden, the container runtime engine for Cloud Foundry, and it will delete an application that's been deemed as tainted. Uh, you can see a little bit about the growth as well and the number of monthly downloads. Uh, we're seeing lots of good momentum, as you can see, over the last uh, several months. Uh, we've ma maintained uh, about 2,700 downloads per month, uh, and the Docker Hub polls are, are trending about 250 to 200 polls per hour. So that's anywhere from uh, 30,000 to 40,000 a week uh, that we're seeing as far as downloads are concerned for the Falco Docker image. Uh, we integrate in with a number, uh, so slide 12. Uh, we integrate in with a variety of different projects, so Kubernetes, Rocket, uh, Containerd, and Fluency uh, in the CNCF space. Uh, we also integrate in with tools like our own open source tool, Sysdig, 
uh, Mesos and Marathon, as well as Cloud Foundry as well. Uh, we ship with 25 rules around container best practices out of the box. Uh, and you can kind of see an example there in one of the blog posts we wrote around collecting security events from uh, Kubernetes and those pushing those back into an EFK stack uh, and allowing you to build kind of a, a SIM dashboard that shows you where in your environment rules might be triggering uh, and firing. <clears throat> Uh, we also recently shipped uh, a bunch of default rules for common applications as well. So things like Nginx, Apache, uh, etcd, Kubernetes, GKE, and so forth uh, as well. And those are available up on our GitHub repository. <clears throat> so slide 13 uh, gives us a little bit of an example of what you can actually do with Falco. Uh, this is uh, a little bit of a proof of concept that we created. Uh, this is where Falco, uh, so when you deploy Falco to Kubernetes, you run it as a daemon set. So uh, Falco will run on all of your worker nodes. Uh, and then it will detect any abnormal behavior, not only inside of the containers, but also on the node itself as well. So we see this as very valuable. So when Falco detects one of these behaviors that is deemed as abnormal, uh, we'll publish into a NATS topic. Uh, then we have Kubeless, which will actually go and pick up those alerts or will be triggered uh, by those messages being published to NATS. And that gives us a lot of functionality as far as what we can do as far as actions are concerned. So we can send notifications. We could log that uh, alert as well. But then we can also execute actions. Uh, and some of the actions that we've shipped, uh, th which are available in the Falco uh, GitHub repository, are things like killing the offending pod, uh, marking a node is tainted so that new workloads can't get scheduled on it, but the node is still around so that you can do forensics on it, um, uh, doing things like network isolation uh, as well. And then we also have some generic notification ones that we pushed as well. Kubeless is just uh, one of the ones that we uh, decided to work with, one of the functions as a service frameworks that we decided to work with. Uh, this would, of course, be applicable to any functions as a service uh, framework that you wanted to use. Uh, slide 14, uh, I'll hand it over to Loris. Uh, yes, a little bit of uh, landscape uh, in which uh, uh, Falco operates uh, these slides. Uh, as two columns, one is uh, open source uh, comparable tools and the, the other one is proprietary. As you can see uh, in open source, I mean, uh, uh, of course, you know, security uh, is uh, a big landscape uh, with many pieces that uh, typically work together. So uh, here we list uh, some uh, of the projects that uh, are sort of, you know, complementary uh, or cover maybe other aspects uh, of uh, uh, cloud native uh, security uh, like uh, Anchor, Claire, Inspect, Cilium, Notary, Tuff, Spiffy, Vault, and so on. But in practice, as far as we know, um, uh, what uh, Dusty before described uh, as runtime security, we believe that Falco, at least uh, you know, in the in, in the cloud native environment, is uh, is pretty unique as a tool. Uh, in the other column, we have proprietary tools, and there uh, we are listing some of the commercial vendors uh, that uh, offer uh, solutions uh, for uh, runtime security. Uh, in particular, the first one is Sysdig Secure, which is uh, uh, a product by our company, Sysdig, uh, and uh, uh, which actually uh, leverages uh, the Falco rules engine uh, to offer uh, its functionality. So our approach there is uh, just, uh, you know, build uh, a layer on top of what we offer a completely as open source uh, uh, as Falco and potentially make it possible for other entities, uh, uh, open source projects and company to, to do the same. Uh, other tools are Aqua Security, Twist Locks, Stack Rocks, New Vector. Again, these are uh, examples there. There is more, but this, sh this should give a pretty good idea. Slide 15 is a little bit of uh, uh, forward looking so um, 
uh, Dusi showed the uh, architectural diagram of uh, Falco before. These lights uh, as uh, a few blue uh, boxes, which is uh, what uh, we want to add. First of all, uh, in terms of uh, collection, as we were saying, currently Falco essentially consumes system call from uh, our own kernel module or uh, in, in the near future, eBPF uh, uh, scripts. Uh, we want uh, to enrich the input for the tool uh, and uh, increase the data, the data that is fed to the uh, expression engine and to the rules so that uh, there's more context, especially more context from, uh, again, uh, CNCF projects maybe, or, or in any case, uh, projects in the ecosystem that can provide input to, to the rule engine. And in terms of output, uh, uh, we're constantly working on uh, making uh, Falco more integrated in terms of output with uh, any other tool, and in particular to uh, output integrations that we have uh, uh, in our roadmap, uh, for example, our NATS and, and uh, Webhook, so that, again, other tool can consume uh, the output of our rule engine. Uh, slide 16 is a bit of a roadmap. This slide is pretty dense. Of course, I won't have time to go through uh, each of the entries in this slides. In this slide, but uh, uh, let's say from the short term, uh, a bunch of work uh, that uh, uh, will, will be done or has already been done. As you can see, there's quite a bit of shift uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> both uh, deployment of Falco, so making it uh, uh, more seamless uh, and uh, better integrated with both. Uh, let's say the operating operating system, uh, in this case Linux, and um, the uh, orchestrators that can run it as a container. Uh, rules library, uh, again, a bunch of uh, rules uh, that uh, we and or the community are working on. Um, uh, for example, you know, stuff like uh, applications like NGINX or HAProxy, but also CNCF projects uh, like uh, Kubernetes and Prometheus and, uh, and FluentD and so on. So the ability essentially to create profiles for these uh, projects. So when, when you deploy Falco uh, as a component, for example, in Kubernetes, uh, there's uh, a bunch of uh, functionality and rules in Falco that can harden uh, out of the box uh, Kubernetes and, and all of the components of the Kubernetes ecosystem. And also a bunch of rules for CIS compliance. Uh, longer term, uh, Kubernetes integration is definitely on our radar. For example, the first bullet network policies is one uh, that we think is uh, particularly useful because it will allow to evaluate Kubernetes network policies without necessarily uh, have at least at, a, at an initial point to enforce them. Um, uh, alert output, uh, I mentioned that in the previous slides. Uh, more data, I mentioned it in the previous slides. And one that uh, I'm personally pretty excited about is uh, baselining. So the ability for Falco to do its detection and its enforcement uh, automatically by learning essentially the environment versus uh, having uh, to uh, be configured with manual rules. Slide 17 uh, is uh, about licensing. So cur uh, currently, uh, Falco is GPLv2, mostly for historical reasons, because uh, uh, part of the stack is a kernel module, uh, which uh, typically uh, requires to be um, uh, released as a GPLv2. So as a consequence, we initially, uh, like Forces Dig, uh, released our stack as GPLv2. We understand that these uh, can uh, uh, create concerns. Our plan going forward would be uh, uh, moving, uh, keeping uh, the kernel part as GPL uh, v2 because, or at least with the dual license, because we cannot avoid it essentially if we want that to run in the Linux kernel. But uh, uh, move the open source part, uh, move sorry the user level part and the the libraries and the engine uh, to something that is uh, uh, compatible with uh, CNCF and in particular to the Apache license v2. Slide 18, I'm going to hand it uh, back to Dusi. Thanks. Um, so what we're looking for uh, is really in two different areas. So technical collaboration. Um, I think it's really important, uh, especially in the open source world, that we start talking more about security. Uh, I know some people in the industry, uh, such as Jess, uh, has done a lot of work in this area. Uh, but I think we, if we get more feedback uh, 
from other people as, as to what we need to be building uh, in this project would be very helpful. Uh, we do need help with the project governance process, which is something that we think that the CNCF can help with a lot. Uh, integrations for event consumption and notifications. Uh, and of course, we still need uh, talk sponsors to enter the CNCF sandbox uh, as well. Uh, and then as well as some industry insights, so guidance on roadmap and future integrations and guidance on the security paradigms that we can help solve uh, as well. Uh, and I did notice that Brett from cloud.gov has joined uh, as well. So if anyone has any questions uh, about actual usage, uh, Brett might be able to provide a little bit of perspective. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm late, folks. I, uh, West Coast, and I, over, I overslept an alarm here. Uh, hey, I, I'll, I, just, I'll, I'll say briefly, if people don't have questions, uh, with cloud.gov, we have a multi-tenant um, Cloud Foundry-based installation that we use for the government. Um, compliance as a service is sort of the main reason we exist. Um, a lot of the compliance in the federal government uh, requires people to understand when their code is compromised and, um, and what they're going to do about it. And although it's a great platform in every other way, our customers are kind of, you know, they're running their stuff in containers. They don't have a lot of ability to monitor their own stuff. So we can say it's a customer responsibility to do this, but there's no real technical way for them to accomplish that. And as soon as we started looking at, at Falco, that became the avenue for us to provide this for our customers and everybody kind of breathed the big sigh of relief. So uh, we try and be open source in everything we do. And we were not finding a lot of other good solutions for doing this. This is the first one that we came across. We um, gave a presentation at the Cloud Foundry Summit about what we did with it, um, but it it kind of was ready made for for this use case of uh, you know multi tenant container based environment where our our customers needed to have some sort of notion of integrity of the of what was actually running in the container. You could do chain of custody on the code and the and the image and so on, but once it comes to okay, what about after it's running? there wasn't a lot that they could do, um, but us as platform operators, we had to handle it, handle it. And the only real thing that we found out there that was open source that we could use was, was Falco. So with that, I'll take any questions anybody has about it. How composable are the rule sets? Taking a look at the example that was linked from the slides, there was a big monolithic file that was 1600 lines long with rules for lots of different applications like Cassandra and ActiveMQ and Elasticsearch and MySQL. I would, ex that seems to significantly reduce the value of a container platform to be able to sort of run arbitrary applications anywhere. Um, so I would think that we would need some sort of mechanism for composition that an application could bring its own rule set with it. Is yeah. that possible today? Yeah, the first step that we uh, have done to make that uh, possible is just create a rules.d directory. And so any rules that are put in the rules.d directory will be loaded up and parsed by Falco. Uh, and so that's definitely the first step to allow applications to kind of bring their own rules. Uh, we think that there could probably be better ways to do it, but um, this is one of the reasons why we're having the conversation, right? Uh, so that we can learn and understand what direction we need to take the project. Something like that would need to be a part of like the image specification though, because at that point you want to ship it with the, the container image itself. So like that should be something that should be pushed upstream towards OCI mm -hmm. more than being like its own kind of separate thing. I was yeah. actually thinking of something like a uh, Graphius to attach additional metadata associated with the image. Yeah, exactly. Both, both ways uh, would be great ways, essentially. Exactly. I mean, uh, our, uh, ideal motion uh, with Falco is uh, as, you know, uh, uh, it really gets adopted for runtime security. At the point, these hooking points are much better than, than the YAML file that we that we currently have and make it, of course, way more powerful because especially, yeah, something like uh, Graphias uh, where you can do it in a more like, you know, uh, organized uh, and centralized way or the, or, or the container image at that point empower uh, the use of this is in a much more distribu distributed and automated way, right? As a, as a base engine underneath, essentially, you're running containers. Yeah, but like Graphius or whatever, like that's not a standard. Like that's kind of like it's, you know, Google's project. So what I was saying was like something like a rules for security needs to be a standard that's pushed upstream through OCI so that everyone can use it and not just the people who are using like Graphius on Google Cloud or whatever. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think a challenge with that is that the tool ecosystem is not going to just be one or two, two things. People need to be able to build new kinds of tools and have those get deployed. So we need some kind of mechanism for composition of new specifications and new tools that doesn't require just going through a centralized body. I Maybe this specific thing might make sense, but then you know, there will be 10 other things that don't make sense. Yeah, but Jess makes a good point about having it at the OCI layer because at that point, it's a little bit more uh, controlled and out of the developer's whim, whether if those rules get included or not. And it's a little bit more active enforcement than hoping that they've attached the right graphics. Well, administrators could also have policies that says that no yeah. containers can run that don't include such rules. Yes, possibly. Yeah, and by the way, from, from this point of view, uh, you're right, the, the YAML file, the current YAML approach of Falco is not the best way to, to approach this, but at the same time, the engine uh, and the language, these are just essentially a generic, you know, domain language that is based on, on system call and the pretty simple syntax. And uh, uh, from this point of view, of course, our goal from the beginning was just mostly uh, offering something to, you know, like describe based on the unit that we think is, is pretty close to, you know, what uh, at the system level, a process or a container does, which is system calls. Uh, and it's, you know, completely, uh, open and already used by other tools like open source CISDIG and by, by several uh, other tools. Uh, and just, you know, being able to express essentially uh, process and container behavior based on that. And uh, uh, at that point uh, that can be used, uh, yeah, uh, by people as uh, um, like a form of, of, of description that can also be orthogonal to our engine, you know, could also be enforced uh, in, a, in other ways. For example, I don't know, at the network lay, layer through uh, one of the, uh, you know, uh, network uh, uh, or firewall systems uh, that uh, are part of the CNCF ecosystem. Thanks. Uh, what other questions can we answer for you? Do we need to do a demo or? I think there's a question on um, rules being based on things other than syscalls. So it's kind of like we're adding EDCF in August and, um, you know, network policy potentially in the next couple of months, et cetera. Could I, is the plan to extend the, the rules definition to have things that are not just syscalls? Go ahead, Lars. Yeah, this was part of one of the slides. So the answer oh, sorry, is uh, the answer is yes, uh, and it's uh, already part of our roadmap. Uh, yeah, there okay. are, I was again, wondering if the network policy piece that you mentioned and all that was okay. Thank you. Exactly. Network policy is a very good example, but uh, I don't know. Other examples are, for example, Kubernetes events, you know, that can be used uh, as, as, a, as a source for this and, and many other things that, that we have in mind. In a general way, again, this is a general, you know, uh, approach and uh, architecture it's open to, to new uh, sources of input and we're working on adding them. Yeah, and right now you can actually pull back uh, Kubernetes metadata as well as Mesos and Marathon metadata as well to say apply rules to certain namespaces or pods or particular deployments inside of Kubernetes. So we do have that functionality to be able to talk to other APIs and pull back that metadata and enhance the rule set that way. And I have a more kind of philosophical question, which is do you plan to add more security based things or general monitoring based things going forward? Like where do you see yourself fit in which category? So with, with Falco specifically, uh, our current use case is more like uh, uh, security and uh, you know monitoring behaviors from the security point of view. Uh, this doesn't mean that Falco uh, potentially is not uh, useful for, you know, like more like vanilla monitoring as well. Uh, but uh, honestly, uh, currently we are focusing more on like, uh, you know, uh, uh, the security use case with this Thank tool. You. What other questions can we answer for anyone? How does uh, Falco compare to Open Policy Agent? Is that something that you've looked at or that you've thought about? Uh, it's not something that we've looked at. Uh, Loris might have. I know personally I haven't. Uh, Loris, do you have anything? No, I'm not uh, familiar. 
Okay, oh, I suggest taking a look openpolicyagent.org. And one difference in, in the way it is applied is that it's, uh, OPA, at least in, in many cases, is uh, invoked synchronously to do authorization checks effectively with pretty arbitrary policies. Uh, whereas Falco uh, looks like an asynchronous detection mechanism. But they, so they seem complementary, but maybe some of the rules might be similar. Yeah, we'll definitely take a look. Yeah, Brian, I think that they, they are complementary. We um, you know o OPA doesn't have a uh, Linux kernel hooks, uh, you know, to you know sit, sit in line of syscalls. Sure, that that aspect I, I get is unique. But as they talk about applying Falco to other uh, input sources, then that's where yeah. essentially there are some uh, potentially some overlapping use cases. I guess events, Kubernetes events, are another case where you wouldn't uh, inject it into the authorizing whether the event exists or not. It would be a detection mechanism, um, but. Uh, yeah, I was just thinking about whether the rules languages could end up looking similar, which would be convenient for operators who want to use both. Yeah. yeah. All right. <clears throat> I think we've we're done on questions. Um, are we at the point where any suitably credentialed TOC members would like to sponsor this into the sandbox or do you want to think about it? I'm willing to sponsor it, Alexis. Okay. So would, do we have a second for that? Yeah, I can do that, Quinton. Okay, great. Chris? Yeah, duly noted. Thank you. Very good presentation, Deucey. Thank you very much. Also, Loris. Yep, yeah. thanks for having us. Thank, you, thank, you. thank you, guys. Okay, um, back to the slides. So, this is uh, my chance to ask for input. Uh, we have a governing board meeting next week. Uh, it's an offsite in San Francisco, and uh, I will be present along with a couple of other TOC members, such as Ben Hindman. Uh, I really, really appreciate it if um, I felt that I was representing the TOC in practice as well as in theory in this particular case. So um, you know, usually in these meetings, there's an opportunity to uh, share concerns, ask questions uh, of the GB, get direction, and generally sync up on things, level set. Uh, so please, please, this is an appeal for your input uh, on things that you would like me to discuss on your behalf um, at the GB next week. Um, some of the things that are concerns for me are listed here. So I think that, you know, we have an ongoing and probably never ending theme around uh, making projects happy. You know, we have done a good job of understanding the needs of our projects. Uh, the particular projects that I think we can help the most and should pay the closest attention to are the ones which are already quite well known and of some size, but not as humongous as Kubernetes. And so, so I'm thinking of here Envoy, Prometheus, and other projects of that sort of scale, or, or heading in that direction. You know, if you know the principles, please, you know, ask them. This is, this is a chance to bring things up. Last year, we had a discussion about this, talking about Envoy, uh, as an example, and, and Matt had provided some thoughts. Uh, do please uh, contribute on this topic if you'd like to. The second area where I would really like to understand what we could do better and where we can ask the GB for help or money is around education um, and other things that are appealing to developers and other technical people in the industry as users, uh, individual users. What can we do to help them feel more comfortable about cloud native? Uh, and, and we're talking here about potentially millions of people. I would be really, really delighted if CNCF or a foundation that could serve the needs of all developers, not a small subset like some other foundations have done. So what can we do to make cloud native easier, 
simpler and better for people. Another area that's on my mind at the moment is now that we're starting to have end users in the, tier, in the, in the CNCF, I think there's about 65 or 70 sponsoring end user members. Uh, what does the TOC want from end users? What, you know, in the, in the presentation, uh, the SysDig uh, team uh, specifically called that out as something that they would like to hear about. And I'm sure that that's very important to many people. Um, what are the right ways to interact? I mean, obviously Sam comes in sometimes uh, as the representative of the end users, but you know, we could have a higher bandwidth level of communication, but it starts with identifying areas that we want to talk about. Uh, so that's important to me. And then finally, and I think perhaps most important structure, you know, there's a lot of projects coming into the CNCF and I think it's start, time to start thinking about how do we have um, more shape to what could otherwise be a, you know, horizontal set of otherwise identical things. So, you know, should we think about grouping projects and having more focused missions around groups of projects? For example, security. Uh, security is a very big theme this year. We've seen uh, Spiffy and Spire and Opera, and we, today we talked about Falco, and there are other things in the security space. You know, should we be forming groups around security projects, whether they're graduated or incubated or sandbox, doesn't matter, and having um, separate teams go out and get together and work on common questions around security. The same thing for observability, um, continuous delivery, uh, uh, and so on. You know, not just orchestration, of course. So these are just thoughts I've been having, and I'm also particularly concerned that now that Kubernetes seems to be adopted by a lot of different companies and maybe kind of the de facto orchestrator of choice going forward, um, are we going to see a proliferation of things that run on top of Kubernetes? Uh, and what, what, what are we going to do about those things? You know, are we going to um, have a thousand different projects that do machine learning, drone control, IoT, serverless, mesh, you know, 15 of each of these things? What are we going to do about that? Because it's going to be uh, quite a mess if we're not careful. So and those are the things that are bothering me. Uh, I'm sure there are things that are bothering you too, including why does this Alexis guy shut up? So I've created a document, which is linked to here for people to, to put their own ideas down uh, for the GB meeting. You can just click on the link and stick stuff in there. And we can talk about it on the call. We've got 20 minutes left today. Uh, if anyone wants to speak out on things that's really, really bothering you that you want to bring up with the GB. You know, one thing I would add to your point about uh, do we need to have, um, you know, the idea of working groups towards project groups, and then you mentioned security uh, becoming more and more of a topic. Uh, I think something that would be really, really helpful is to have a cloud native security landscape uh, and being able to understand what are the stack of open source tools and what layer in the stack do they fit? Uh, are they infrastructure security? Are they runtime security? Are they build security tools? Uh, and how how you go and build an open source security stack to make sure that uh, your environment is safe and secure for your end users. Yeah. So how to build a stack. Lessons. And that's something uh, we at Cystic would be more than willing to help uh, help build. Right. I mean, we're starting to see this almost as a pattern now emerging organically from the working groups. The serverless working group uh, did a white paper and they did a landscape and they started working on a uh, common definition of a cloud event, uh, which a couple of people then implemented. And I think that that kind of pattern could be repeated with other um, areas, security being another. We, we have already a rich set of projects that cover observability. Um, but we don't have a way of bringing them together. So, um, you know, it's, it's just implied, it's not stated. Uh, these are all areas where we could, if we wanted to, divert attention at work, which might or might not help users and customers and all of those good things. Yeah, I think the serverless Hi, this work is Dan Khan. Wait, can Brian, Brian G finish and then the other person jump yeah, in? Yeah, please go ahead. Sorry, Dan. Oh. Yeah, I was going to say the uh, serverless work group white paper, I think is a good idea in terms of uh, defining some terminology and s sort of specking out um, 
checking out the landscape. I think the landscape uh, tool is also can potentially uh, be a counterpart to that to actually, you know, as we create new uh, categorizations to actually get those into the landscape tool so people can search for it. And then um, some, something else that probably would be needed is something like a reference architecture so that people can see how those things could, could all fit together uh, in sort of a cohesive way because it, the surface area is super complex uh, right now. So, you know, leaving it as an exercise to the readers is definitely pretty challenging. Yeah. Brian, maybe you could put some bullets into the document. I'm just trying to keep up with what you're saying. Sure. I'll, I'll do that in a bit. I had some comments on the other part. Uh, Go for it. Parts the bullets, but I can let Dan Go if he had a point about this topic. Oh, just very briefly, I wanted to mention that we do have an active mailing list right now called cncf-reference-architecture at list.cncf.io. And maybe Chris or someone could type that into the chat window. But uh, Ken Owens has been orchestrating our efforts on making some revisions to the landscape. And so we'd love to have uh, more folks come in and, and assist us on looking at the projects we're aware of right now in, in the security and compliance space and whether a different organization uh, would make more sense or whether there's enough of them that will need to eventually break it out into its own uh, sub landscape. That's all. Thanks, Dan. Back to you, Brian. Uh, yeah, so speaking, uh, I guess, of different flavors of reference architecture, something that I think would be very helpful from end users uh, would be for them to describe their applications and how, you know, at, at some level of detail, um, what they actually need functionality wise and what the topologies actually look like and how they map on to our existing cloud native projects and where gaps might potentially be. Certainly that's something I always find very useful when I talk to users is really understanding how they're using what we build, um, and sometimes it's it's surprising, um, and I think that's where end users can provide a lot of value. Uh, is actually you know saying, well, we're building all this technology. How does it actually get used? Is it actually usable? Um, are we actually meeting all of their needs? Yeah. Good, thank you. I put that into the slide, but I'm going to put it into the um, into the document as well. And then, uh, with respect to structure, I, th this has come up uh, in a number of the discussions about potential sandbox projects as well. But um, figuring out how to organize, you know, we have Kubernetes obviously has a. a a big and growing ecosystem. And some of the other projects like Prometheus and Envoy are starting to grow their own ecosystems as well. Um, it might make sense to just make that explicit and obvious to folks and just kind of have, I don't know, solar systems of, of projects and the things that orbit them uh, as some kind of explicit subgroups within the CNCF. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the the discussion around Cortex highlighted this. You know, um, the Prometheus team don't have their own sandbox, and you know, Cortex is simultaneously a Kubernetes and a Prometheus sandbox project. So obviously, it can take advantage of the CNCF sandbox. But you know, we can do that with a few more projects, and then all of a sudden, we'll, we'll have further confusion because the work, people won't be able to see the shape. Of things, so I think your idea is is a good one, Brian, on that front. Affiliation. Yeah, it could also encourage our projects to think of themselves more as platforms, which right. I think would be good in terms of growing growing the set of composable functionality for users to consume. Yeah. Good. Anyone else want to comment on this? So your silence implies 
because of what I said earlier that you're all happy. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at the doc. There you later. go. There you go. Just, go on. I'm just I'm just walking around right now, so hard to do. Good comment. Thanks. The, the doc was empty at the start of this discussion. Um, I, yeah, in terms of the app app tools, um, I think that's worthy of a longer discussion. I don't know that there's a way to necessarily uh, that it's necessarily a problem for lots of different competing solutions uh, to, to develop. And I'm not sure that it's preventable. If we look at what happens in JavaScript frameworks, for example, there always seems to be yet another new one. Um, I don't know how developers feel about that. I, I have seen some blog posts about the constant churn of frameworks, but uh, I think there are, there are reasons why that happens. I don't know. You know, I'll say this. So, so this is Matt Farina here. In, in Kubernetes SIG apps, we've been talking about app tools lately. And there are a lot of gaps, whether we're talking about debugging things, like how do you debug something while it's running inside of a container, right? To, and there are a couple of ways. But there's a lot of tools, like how do I test something offline if I'm dealing with serverless, right? If it's functions as a service, how do I test it when it's entirely offline in my own development environment? What is it like to have a local thing like Minikube plus a bunch of things so I can locally develop versus developing out in a cloud development environment? Because sometimes I can't run everything locally. It just takes up too much memory and resources. How do I deal with this? And there's a lot of space for app tools here. And, and I would argue that the space is pretty immature right now. I'm so not exactly sure what to do with it, but. Yeah, look, I'm, I think you're right. Um, I was hoping you'd be on the call because I wanted to ask you what happened to the working group working group. You know, this is the thing where we were going to try and figure out what, what, what should working groups do, what should their minimum criteria be, and their exit criteria, which I think you were involved with. I think that's part of this discussion because we're essentially saying, let's bring this together with the themes that, uh, such as what Brian said. Just on the app tools, I, I would personally want to separate uh, two different pieces out, one being the uh, whole sort of dev to cluster story, which I see more as part of pipelines and the other being uh, the story about application frameworks. For, for me, those are things like, you know, for example, Kubeflow, uh, which should be an orthogonal concern, but it, it may not be. Yeah, it, when it comes to, so there's kind of two things. So uh, the discoverability of tools can kind of be a problem right now. So getting more uh, app dev tools into the landscape and categorized would probably be useful for everybody who's searching for things. Um, on the whole working group, working group front, I think Chris was the one who was handling that. And yep. there's an open pull request with a whole bunch of stuff in it that still needs to be worked through on that. Yep. Uh, I, I think that's actually what's holding up the safe working group, which is kind of a subset of the whole security picture from going through. Chris, you might have more to say. Yep, that's exactly it. It's, it's, we just have to get through that pull request and get some of the comments that were made. That's all my to-do list. Yeah, I, I agree with Matt about the discovery of, of tools. Most of the tools have less than 100 GitHub stars. So like they fly by in, in a blog post and a tweet. And if you weren't watching when it happened, there's no way to find them. And that's actually created the problem of you might have three or four tools that do the exact same thing um, because people didn't know about each other working on the tool. Yeah. No, they're very similar to JavaScript web frameworks at the moment. It's, it's basically a feral jungle environment. Okay, anyone else? Last call for comments. Uh, don't forget the document will stay up and I'll look at it periodically. Do you please put some ideas there. I'll try and bring up the main points next week at the GB meeting. Thanks very much, everybody. I think we're done for today. Cool. Take care, all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks,